Hey guys, thanks for checking into Brainwaves this week. Before the show gets started, please do us a solid and rate the podcast on iTunes. Let us know how we're doing. Now, on to the episode. You know, the interesting thing about functional movement disorders is, or functional neurologic disorders, they can really mimic all other conditions. Then, of course, a lot of uh, patients get worked up for stroke. Uh, but, you know, in most cases, it's actually um, possible to make a, a diagnosis with a, a pretty good reliability. So while I agree, you know, it's not always straightforward to make a diagnosis, I think once uh, people do undergo training, and especially in movement disorders, it's actually not that difficult. Many neurologic diagnoses are purely clinical, and by that I mean the best diagnostic tool we have is sometimes only that which we can do at the bedside. The medical specialty of neurology demands this of us, because at some level it boils down to distinguishing the organic, tissue-based conditions from the inorganic, functional ones. When is a seizure actually a manifestation of aberrant electrical circuitry, and when is it a pattern of abnormal movements without an electrophysiologic origin? When is a headache caused by a disturbance in the trigeminovascular pathway? And when is it an uncontrollable stress response? When does weakness emerge from the mind and not from the impaired neurons and nerve connections? Often when the imaging test is unremarkable, or the EEG doesn't show a seizure, or whatever test you do doesn't come back completely normal, sometimes healthcare professionals will just blame the patient for the symptoms they're manifesting. There are a lot of misconceptions in the public and and among healthcare professionals that these patients are just not genuinely ill, that these patients are all somehow voluntary bringing on their symptoms and now faking, malingering out to kind of for disability benefits, etc. This is Dr. Catherine Lefevre, who joins me this week on the segment. I'm Assistant Professor of Neurology and the Director of the Movement Disorder Clinic uh, here at University of Louisville in Kentucky. And Dr. Lefevre, like many other neurologists and psychiatrists, are working hard to correct this misunderstanding. Patients aren't faking anything. At least not all the patients. Some are truly disabled by whatever's happened to them. Whether it's a problem controlling seizures or pain or tremor, just because there's not a structurally abnormal area of the brain or the nerves, it doesn't mean that the patient's not suffering. So, this week on Brainwaves, Dr. Lefevre and I will be discussing how complex and interesting these cases can be, and why intervention can really benefit these patients and their quality of life. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Lefevre. My pleasure. Very nice talking to you. So this week's episode is one of the Teaching Through Clinical Cases episodes where we discuss a case, an interesting patient that you've seen, and how to approach the chief complaint and manage the disorder. So let's start with your case. Sure. So uh, the patient we we are talking about was a, a 22-year-old uh, junior high school football coach, and um, he presented initially with bilateral leg numbness and weakness. It was a Friday night back in March of 2016. For the show this week, I also got to interview the patient that Dr. Lefevre is talking about. My name is Jason Lindsley. Uh, I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is about. Uh, an hour west of Philadelphia. I am 22 years old and I'm a current college student at Millersville University, which is located in Lancaster. There, I'm a major in social work. And along with that, I am a football coach at Lane Peter Strasburg High School. It was nice to chat with him too, if only to get his perspective on how all this went down. I was coaching baseball at the time and I was starting batting practice. That evening, I was getting ready to go to bed and the next morning was going to visit my brother in Philadelphia. What happened was my body went into a complete state of shock. Like I was numb from head to toe and all of those symptoms went away after an hour. And then what happened was it felt like I had the flu. So I had the shakes. I was cold, sweating all at the same time, but didn't have a fever. It was really weird. After about two more hours, it turned into excruciating back pain to the point where I couldn't sit still. I was like laying on the ground just all over the place, rolling around the floor in so much pain. When my parents found me after I was yelling for them to help, I went to the emergency room that evening, was treated for a herniated disc in my lower back that I previously had. They sent me away with pain medication, 
throughout the course of the next seven days, I went to the emergency room three separate times, was told that I was just going in for pain medication, kept getting turning away by the ER doctors and the nurses in there until seven days after the onset of my symptoms that following Friday, I woke up and was unable to walk. So back pain, numbness, and rapidly progressive weakness, which sounds like it could be a spine problem, maybe a herniated disc or a compression fracture. And he certainly had history that was concerning for this. I've had a lot of injury in the past through playing football. I had, you know, a knee surgery, ankle surgery, and I've had a nagging back injury ever since I stopped playing three years ago. But x-rays and a spine MRI were all normal. So Jason's primary care physician referred him to a specialist a neurosurgeon who looked at MRIs and x-rays of my spine for the herniated disc issue said he saw nothing there that would ever cause the the presentation I was showing. At that time, a second diagnosis was reached. He was diagnosed with Gambare syndrome, interestingly, on clinical grounds alone. So that's when he called over to the hospital and they got me admitted right away. Where he did unfortunately not uh, make significant improvements. Every time I stood up, I would collapse to the ground, tried to pick up my legs, I would have tremors. Any time I tried to pick up my leg completely, like straight up, it would just shake up and down uncontrollably. So I just had no control over what was going on. I couldn't stop it. I actually had to have somebody grab a hold of my leg to make it stop. They progressed from my legs the whole way up into my arms and my shoulders and my neck area. It was really weird. Both his uh, spinal tap and neuroimaging studies and EMG nerve conduction studies were actually normal. Which has to make you wonder, if his symptoms were so severe and rapidly progressive, why did these tests show absolutely nothing? And he was treated with um, IVIG. They said it wouldn't hurt to start right away with the intravenous IVIG stuff. So they got me involved with that right away. I find it interesting that you said they said it wouldn't hurt to try the treatment even without a clear diagnosis. And a lot of times we don't have a diagnosis. Did they go through the risks and the benefits of certain treatments for you before they started treating you? To my recollection, no, not really. I think more of what was going on, they they put me right in the ICU. So it's kind of like everything happened really fast. After which, he was discharged to an inpatient rehabilitation facility, where he spent quite a bit of time, and not really getting any better. He was then seen for a second opinion at a teaching hospital in Philadelphia, and was re-diagnosed with a functional movement disorder. They couldn't find anything medically wrong. And when doctors can't figure out the cause for a patient's unusual symptoms, they presume that it's psychogenic. They diagnosed me with a conversion disorder. And uh, was sort of uh, not offered much from there on. It was kind of making it out to me like it was all my fault that all this was going on. And then right before he left the room, he said, you know, because we don't know what's going on, I guess we'll just have to find out the autopsy. And uh, from that point, I was sent into the Good Shepherd Rehab Center for a stay there to kind of just see if I could work through the quote-unquote, psychological problems I was having. But the diagnosis wasn't really all that clearly shared with him. I mean, that comment about figuring out what's wrong with him at autopsy? I'm really honestly shocked by that. Saying that kind of thing to a patient is never appropriate. It's just very, it was very insensitive the way that that whole side of things was being taken care of. And even after I was diagnosed with conversion, I saw... I think three or four different psychologists and neuropsychologists. And after one visit, they all sent me away because they were telling me like, well, we don't see anything here that we can help you with in terms of a conversion disorder. So we always just kept being funneled back into that psychological loop of having to go see a bunch of specialists, but being sent away after one visit kind of thing. It was a very difficult situation for him. He had to uh, stop going to college. He had to move back in with his parents Um, He was using crutches and an electric scooter for um, ambulation. Uh, So he was kind of teaching or coaching from the sidelines and, uh, you know, just kind of really try to keep a a positive attitude as much as possible. It was a tough situation to be in because 
you know, on one hand, they're telling you nothing's wrong. So that's most of the time a good thing. But the issue was their demeanor was frustrated and it kind of just felt like since they couldn't figure something out, they were just trying to push me out of there. Told me he more or less uh, at some point had resigned himself to probably being disabled for the rest of his life. After about nine months of that, me and my parents sat down and we kind of decided that it, maybe it would be best if we just kind of took a break and tried to just accept the situation I was in and see how we can adapt my current standing in my life to be able to do the things I was doing before I got sick. Nine months this went on for. But although Jason had somewhat resigned to knowing that he would have this problem, perhaps for the rest of his life, his mother continued to look for answers. She came across some information online that was published by Dr. John Stone. Dr. Stone, of the University of Edinburgh, founded the UK Functional Neurologic Disorder Society. And when Jason's mom reached out to him, he then referred them to Dr. Lefevre, who had trained under Dr. Stone and was practicing at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. And in February 2017, Jason finally met Dr. Lefevre, nearly an entire year after his first symptoms. I went out with expectations of with just being sent away from everyone and kind of just being told that this is the way you're going to be the rest of your life. But when I went to go see Dr. LeFevre out there, they and her staff really did an awesome job in the three hours that I met with them just kind of saying, hey, there's hope here. But not everybody is a great candidate for this program. Listen to Dr. LeFevre describe how it works. To be a candidate for our program, they need to have daily symptoms they can't have spells where they lose consciousness uh, because then it becomes really hard to work with physical therapy if, if uh, you have a seizure-like spells, essentially, or blackout spells. Um, and also, they need to be um, psychologically stable. So because our program is, is a, a, a one-week program, uh, if people are actively suicidal, etc., then you know that's not the right uh, environment to, uh, to, to do this, or not the right timing, at least. So if all these kind of uh, factors are met, we then admit them for the one-week program. The clinic only takes one patient a week. And then for five days, we'll work three hours per day with PT, OT, speech therapy, and one hour per day with a psychologist with um, cognitive behavioral therapy-based methods. I was their sole focus. The overarching goal is to make the patient regain control of movements and and uh, the exact methods look a little bit different but using relaxation techniques with using visualization techniques people um, can successfully learn to to bring movements back under their control regardless of if you're going to be walking by the time you get out if you're going to get a little bit of improvement we really think that there's something we can do for you Patients should be reassured that the disorders are actually very common and that they can get better. That was the first time that I had ever heard anyone say that to me. Even though I was the way I was, I still had a purpose and that, I, that there was still hope for me to not only get better, but to still be you know, a contributor to society. In uh, this one-week program, he went from walking on crutches and a scooter to basically having a completely normal neurologic function again. I'm able to go back to school full-time, and I'm able to do that without any limitations. So I'm able to be hands-on with my players and show them what I want them to do now, which is something that I really struggled with when I was sick. And right now, it's just really incredible. We have seen very good success. 78% of patients who are significantly improved by the end of a treatment week. And we have done six-month follow-up, um, and the treatment success is maintained in about two-thirds of patients. I think it's especially impressive as the average symptom duration of, of people in our program has been around seven years. So these have often been people who have been uh, quite chronically affected, and about 50% have been on disability, uh, and yet uh, they are able to uh, get better. While improvement and recovery is more of the rule than the exception, not everybody will make such a dramatic recovery. Not all patients will have the same access to resources as Jason and his family did, or patients may be passed around from physician to physician without a clear diagnosis or a plan for treating their symptoms. 
Coming up in the next half of our show, we'll talk more about how a patient with a functional movement disorder is evaluated, and how providers like Dr. Lefebvre help these people fight through their disability. Stay with us. This episode was brought to you in part by Audible. With nearly 200,000 ad-free audiobooks, I'm sure you'll find something you'd like. I recommend Brain on Fire by Susanna Cahallan. It's the story of a Washington Post reporter who describes in vivid detail her battle with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. To hear this book and get your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves and sign up. The first month is free and less than 15 bucks a month for each subsequent month with no cancellation fees. So take a minute to sign up for free at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. It's very challenging to make the diagnosis of functional movement disorder especially early on in the course when there are other conditions that are still in your differential, what would you say are some of the main historical or exam elements that raise your suspicion that this patient had a functional disorder? Basically, we do suspect a functional disorder if there are discrepancies on the neurologic examination that that do not fit. Every time I stood up, I would collapse to the ground. I would have tremors. Variability, you do see some distractibility. Anytime I tried to pick up my leg, it would just shake up and down. And symptoms are often acute in onset. It was a Friday night back in March of 2016. That's not always the case, but but oftentimes they can be acute. What happened was my body went into a complete state of shock. Like I was numb from head to toe. In a a specialist's hand, it's not that hard to to actually distinguish between functional and and, uh, organic disorders. Based on really the uh, examination alone and the history can be very supportive. The more I talked with Dr. Lefebvre, the more I realized that cases like Jason aren't all that unusual. It's actually estimated that around uh, 25 or 30 percent of patients in a neurology clinic have some symptoms, at least, at least in part, which are not completely explained by organic disease. So, not that unusual. They're just unusual for providers who aren't used to managing these kinds of patients. Three to five percent of patients have a functional disorder. Which is really such a shame, because there's a lot of good that can be done for patients like Jason. Patients who are struggling to get around from class to class. Patients like Jason who are trying to give back to the community. Coach high school football and mentor our youth. One review published in Lancet from 2012 reported that the annual losses from absenteeism due to medically unexplained illnesses was more than 18 billion pounds. That's more than the workforce losses that are attributed to patients who suffer from dementia. So it's important not to just help these people psychologically combat their disease, but also to return them to a productive lifestyle, to help them provide for their families and get them back to a normal life. It's definitely possible. And hearing about the patient experiences when they're appropriately and aggressively treated, it's really incredible. So it's very gratifying to see a young person who was so severely affected uh, by this disorder to be able to resume his life and, and not go on and be permanently affected. In order to find some sort of success, it's important not to focus on what made this happen. It's just important to find ways to make it better. There are some patients, as you mentioned, who have more significant psychological factors. Uh, And in these patients, it is very important to to address that. There's such a negative stigma around us who have had FMD. For other patients, these factors might not play a role or or kind of, uh, it might be more reactive depression or reactive anxiety uh, due to the disability and the stigma they are experiencing. You'll be told so many different things and called so many degrading names just throughout the whole process. And you have to understand that, but you also have to be able to find a way to avoid all of it to make sure that you're not tearing yourself down. Because through this whole process, it would have been so easy for me to kind of just accept it and not do anything with the rest of my life and kind of just want to quit, want to give up on even trying to find out how I can get better. You have to find a way to push yourself uh, to limits that you never thought you could be pushed to before. Never give up. At the beginning of the show, Dr. Lefebvre acknowledged that there are a lot of misconceptions about what it means to have a functional neurologic disorder, both from the perspective of the healthcare providers and by the public in general. 
I remember before I started producing this show, I told my mother about one of the interesting patients I had worked with recently. I talked to her about some of the cases that I see because she's the director of a major Alzheimer's support group in Arkansas, where we're from. And this case that I discussed with her was the case of a young woman, also a major caregiver herself, who was extremely overburdened by her job and the stresses that it entailed. She presented with acute aphemia, or the inability to produce spoken language. Like other patients with aphemia, she could understand what was being said and she could communicate back to me. She had even retained her fluency in the American Sign Language, which she learned as a hobby. But when it came to speaking, there was just silence. However, unlike patients with a structural brain lesion responsible for aphemia, this patient I saw could not phonate. She could not move her tongue or lips to command, and yet she could imitate normal mouth behaviors, like licking an ice cream cone, blowing a kiss, and so on. So we diagnosed her with a functional neurologic disorder. When I told my mother about this case, she was beside herself. She was convinced that patients like this woman were always doing this intentionally, whether there was primary or secondary gain, and that there was no way that these patients could not be controlling their symptoms. And it's true, there are many patients who falsify or exaggerate symptoms for secondary gain, malingerers. But a lot of the time, patients can't control these symptoms. And that's when we lean away from a diagnosis of malingering and favor calling it conversion disorder, or better yet, a functional neurologic disorder. Now, the term conversion disorder goes back to this idea people have suffered some horrible trauma that they can't express verbally and then it gets transformed into a physical ailment. And it was really an, an idea propagated by Sigmund Freud. And, you know, while it is certainly true that psychological stress factors can often play a role in these disorders, uh, it's not always the case. And they don't have more stress than any of us uh, or more maladaptive behaviors than any of us. And unfortunately, that often leads to even accusations by healthcare professionals. Well, you just don't remember, but, but you must have been abused or, um, well, you must be doing hard drugs and, uh, you know, without really any evidence for this. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think that there's something to be said about using your clinical gestalt and considering risk factors and incorporating pretest probability. But when you start to incorporate judgment into it, I think that you've gone too far. Sure. And I think that's certainly, uh, you know, fair. And, and we should certainly um, do appropriate testing and in all patients. But uh, again, I think it comes back to um, how is the diagnosis of a functional disorder made? And it really needs to start with a detailed history and exam. And, uh, that and this is arguably your most useful tool when evaluating a patient like this, um, the exam. Obviously, it would be convenient to have completely normal neuroimaging or a lab test, but that's not always the case. You have to feel confident that your exam skills indicate that the patient's neurologic problem is functional. And there are a few features of your history and physical that you can use to identify functional symptoms. And what we do see in, in functional disorders is that there can be a lot of discrepancies uh, and a lot of variability, distractibility of, of findings. You know, if there's a considerable discrepancy, like there's uh, days where they fairly function fairly normal or hours uh, basically where the symptoms go completely away, well, that's certainly what you would not expect with Parkinson's or essential trauma. And while the classic teaching is that you should rely on your diagnostic testing, the MRI, the EEG, or nerve conduction studies, to rule out other organic problems, and only later will you make the diagnosis of a functional disorder as a diagnosis of exclusion. This doesn't have to be the case. Based on historical and, and uh, exam clues, we are um, able to, to make a positive diagnosis, meaning uh, like a rule-in diagnosis based on positive findings rather than a rule-out diagnosis. And, and that's one of the, I think, uh, kind of mistakes that are still in a lot of people's minds. Doing a lumbar puncture or an EMG, these aren't risk-free procedures. You can still make the diagnosis without these unnecessary and oftentimes risky tests if you have enough clinical information that tells you that the patient is functional. The presence or absence of a psychological stress factor is not required for the diagnosis. And this was a major change seen in the DSM-5. That you're not crazy and that it's not all in your head. 
and it's not something that you're doing to yourself. In my experience, I see patients more frequently misdiagnosed with um, organic conditions like multiple sclerosis, which then in fact might actually not be true. And whether you're relying on psychiatric risk factors or not, or if the diagnosis is unclear to you, there's no shame in referring the patient to a specialist who may be more informed. The average time to the diagnosis of a functional movement disorder is 11 months, so that's nearly a full year of sometimes disabling symptoms before the patient receives the correct diagnosis and can be treated. How do you counsel your patients on their abnormal movements and their prognosis? So, um, first of all, I explain how the diagnosis was reached. You know, I tell patients, for example, if they come with tremor, you know, you have a functional tremor and explain what that means, that the way the brain sends signals to the motor region is uh, somehow disrupted and uh, the movements are taken out of their control, which they should not be. So I do tell patients, we don't completely understand why they get these disorders, uh, which is uh, actually true for a lot of conditions, <laughs> yeah, right? We don't always understand why people get multiple sclerosis, for example. And I do explain, because there is not a permanent structural deficit, that uh, it is possible to regain normal neurologic function. Being actively engaged in a rehab process is a uh, necessary, uh, and there's not a, a simple fix. The treatment process does require very active participation from patients, and uh, despite their best efforts, uh, some patients may uh, remain um, disabled. But overall, uh, it is possible for many patients to improve and even regain normal function. If you had to name one thing that really made a difference in your care, whether it was medications, certain healthcare provider interactions, if you met other people, if there was group therapy, like you mentioned, or rehab, what would you say it was and why? The amount of support that I received, not only from my family, but from my community, was just absolutely extraordinary. We had so much support from everyone around us as a family that it really fueled me to have that confidence to kind of just accept and find ways to adapt. If it wasn't from the community and support that I had, honestly, there was no chance that I would be able to accomplish what I did. Perseverance pays off, and not just for the patients and their families, but also for healthcare professionals like Dr. Lefevre and her team who commit themselves fully to their patients. With appropriate counseling and the right blend of physical and occupational therapy, there is hope for patients with functional neurologic disorders. So if there's one message that you can take away from our show this week, it would be to give your patient the benefit of the doubt and to help facilitate their recovery rather than hinder it with judgment. There are opportunities for them, and we can all help out. The episode this week was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, with the help of Dr. Kathleen Lefaver. I'd like to personally thank Jason Lindsley for sharing his incredible story with us, and I think we've all learned something from it. Music this week was courtesy of Cold Noise, Lee Rosevere, and Montplaisir. For more information about Jason and the rehab program run by Dr. Lefaver, check out our blog at brainwaves.me. And if you haven't already, please let us know what you think about the show by rating us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jim Sigler for Brainwaves, thanks for listening.